church. So some of the things I'm going to be discussing today are part of the unveiling of God's mysteries. The Bible says that at that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince of the children of the, the people of Israel. Michael is one of the chief angels. The Bible says that angels are our ministering spirits. They are to minister for us who are heirs of salvation. We don't pray to angels, but angels are God's messengers to us to deliver important messages to us and to be a blessing to us. I will refer us to a passage in Daniel chapter 10 that will explain some important aspect of what we are discussing today. Daniel chapter 10, let's read verse 12. From verse 12 to 14. The Bible says, Then said unto me, Fear not, Daniel. For from the first day that thou didst set thy heart to understand and chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were hard and have come for thy words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days, for the vision is yet for many days. Let's read verse 20 of the same chapter. Then said he, knowest thou whereof, whereof I come unto thee? And now shall I return to fight with the prince of Persia? And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. God's plan for the church of God, God's plan for Israel, God has a plan for his creation, and his plan is on course. Amen. The Bible says that Michael will rise up at the end time to do some astonishing things for the nation of Israel and for the people of God. Why I take you to Daniel chapter 10 is because there is a mystery being unfolded. Nebuchadnezzar saw a vision that he did not understand. He saw an image whose head is of gold, whose arm is of silver, whose belly is of brass and leg of bone, and he does not understand the vision. But God sent a man Daniel, to expand the mystery to Nebuchadnezzar, because it was a plan of God about the kingdom that must occur, that must take place before the end of the world. So this is one of the greatest wisdom of our generation, that God has a plan for our generation, he has a plan for Australia, he has a plan for Nigeria, he has a plan for America, and his plan is on course. Amen. That there is apparent confusion in the world does not abrogate God's plan. Amen. God's plan is on course. Now, this passage about Daniel chapter 10 say a man was sent to deliver answer to Daniel when Daniel was praying for 21 days. And that man was withstood. That man could not deliver the message because the prince of Persia opposing. But God sent Michael to intervene and deliver the message to, to Daniel. And when the man was going back again, the man still said again, chapter 10, verse 20, chapter 10 of Daniel, that as he's going back, he's going to face the prince of Persia again. And I, it's like he needed assistance. The mystery is now is this, that Babylon was replaced by the kingdom of Persia. 
And Persia was replaced by the kingdom of Grecia. And Grecia was replaced by the Roman Empire. But the prince of Persia here we stood Daniel. The prince of Persia is a principality. Daniel is a man that who explain mysteries. Oh. Daniel was a man that can decode mysteries. Oh. When Beshasha saw a handwriting on the wall, Daniel was able to decode it. But this same Daniel, a message that God sent to him was with aid by a principality and power. The point I'm making now is that God has a plan for the humanity. He has a plan for his creation. And that plan cannot be abrogated. It may look not obvious. It may look as if there's a problem. But that plan will come to pass, whether humanity yeah. like it or not. Yeah. So the priest of Persia was the person that withstood the angelic messenger. But Michael has to intervene to remove that prince of Persia so that the prince of Persia may come. Mm. What he's saying is this, that when a kingdom is reigning, like right now America is like a power, China is like a power, all the different nations of the world have their own uniqueness. But there is a plan of God whereby suddenly and without notice, some of those empires will either collapse or will become irrelevant. Mm. And it is part of God's plan. So I'm saying this because we should not be troubled, we should not be afflicted, we should not be afraid of what is happening in the environment because God's plan for us has not changed and God's plan will not change. Amen. It says that God's plan is for good. And his plan for us is for good and not for evil. To give us a future and a hope. Back to our scriptures. Daniel chapter 12. It says that. Let's read verse 2 of Daniel chapter 12. Verse 2. Verse 2 says that and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Verse 2 again. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. This scripture is full of mysteries. It is talking about a resurrection. For that to be a resurrection, it assumes that some event has happened previously. And I want to make some declarations. God made some promises to the heart. Number one, that the seed of the woman shall bruise the head of the serpent. So the serpent shall bruise the heel of the seed, but the seed of the woman shall bruise the head of the serpent. Number two, that Abraham's seed shall be a blessing to all the nations of the heart. And that through the seed of Abraham shall the land of Canaan be blessed, and they shall be a blessing to the nations. And that David's seed, the seed of David, shall rule over the heart. And of his kingdom, there shall be no end. Amen. Of his kingdom, there shall be no end. And these statements, it looks so simple, but there are some points we can drive out of it. God told Abraham 
leave your country, leave your kindred, leave your father's house, and go to a land where I will show you. And I will make of thee a great nation. And I will bless thee and make thy name great. And that shall be a blessing. And I will bless those that bless thee and cause those that cause thee. And in thee shall all the nations of the heart be blessed. So this, the plan that God has for man, for mankind, it includes God using Abraham to start a new life, a new people, a new nation, where the nation of Israel came from. And God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I would like to make some references here that God makes promises to Abraham, he made promises to Isaac, and he made promises to Jacob. The promises that God made to Abraham are for an everlasting inheritance. He said, I will give you this land as an everlasting possession. The same promise he gave to Isaac, I will give you this land as an everlasting possession. The same promise he gave to Jacob, I will give you this land as an everlasting possession. But when God was talking to the people of Israel, the promises became conditional. If you are obedient, then I will do this. But if you're not obedient, I will sell you into captivity. That is why God told David that even when David sinned, he will punish him with the afflictions of men. But the covenant will not be removed forever because it is blessed. That means the covenant that God made with the people of God is irreversible. Amen. That is why in the book of Romans, the Bible says, have they stumbled so as to fall? The, there is a promise. You see, constant the gospel, they are enemies, but they are below for the Father's sake. Mm. So that is why, as Christians, we must always pray for the nation of Israel. Because God's plan for them is irrevocable. God has not changed his mind. The majority of them are not believers today. Has not made God to change his mind. Because God's mm -hmm. plan has not changed. I'm going back to this verse too. He said, many of those that sleep shall awake some everlasting life and some everlasting contempt. The promises, like I said, that God made to the nation of Israel is conditional. A conditional promise cannot fulfill an unconditional promise. Let me mm. say that again. The promises that God gave Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are unconditional. Mm -hmm. The one that he gave the nation of Israel is conditional. Mm -hmm. A conditional promise cannot abrogate mm -hmm. an unconditional assignment. That means that the nation of Israel, even when they fail, the Bible says, have they stumbled so as to fall? Even when the nation of Israel fail, God's plan for Israel and for, for their forefathers will not change because they are beloved for the Father's sake. Mm. So I want to say that resurrection is foretold in the New Testament. Christ said in John chapter 8, verse 58, he said, before Abraham, I am. Oh. And the nature of people of Israel were surprised. What does this mean? He said, before Abraham, I am. One time they were asking Christ, the Sadducees, who do not believe in resurrection from the dead? In Matthew 22, verse 29 and 32, they were asking Christ that they knew a man whose died, who has, who has seven children, who has seven wives at different times. They were not asking that in the resurrection, who's, who will be the husband to that woman? Yeah. It was a mockery. They went to mock Christ. But Christ answered the question that, you see, you are wrong, for you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. Mm. For in the resurrection, they neither marry. But yeah. it is written, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That means that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, though they were dead, 
Mm. They are alive in the spirit. That's what it means. So mm. in this scripture, the resurrection for the dead is implied. And that is why when Christians die now, we don't mourn. Because there's a better life for us. There's a hope for us. There's a hope for us in heaven. So we do not mourn for believers, even when they die, because there's a hope. So, the, so God's plan for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is an eternal covenant. That means that whatever happened right now, the nation of Israel have not occupied the whole land of Canaan. Mm. The promise that God gave Abraham, he said from the river of Egypt unto the great river, even the river Euphrates, mm. shall be your possession. That means that land includes Egypt, it includes Jordan, mm. it includes Syria, mm. it includes Lebanon, mm. it includes part of Iraq and part of Iran. Mm. But Israel has never Occupy the land in fully. They have only mm. occupied it temporarily. Mm. So that means that the full possession of the land is yet to take place. Because the promises of God are yea and amen. amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. So he said, at, at those that sleep shall rise awake to righteousness and some to everlasting shame. This statement is also in chapter 20, when the Bible says, blessed is seed that take part in the first restoration. On them, there shall be no death again. So the first restoration refers to people that have escaped death. They will not suffer eternal damnation again in Jesus' name. Amen. So, now, based on, let's go back to our scriptures. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Go to Daniel to shut up the revelation. He said, because knowledge shall increase, there shall be a lot of mysteries, but Daniel has been assured a place, an inheritance in God. I want to briefly read Malachi chapter 4, before I continue. Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 to 6. Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 to 6. Behold, Behold yes. I will send you Elijah, the prophet, yes. before yes. the great and terrible day of Jehovah's come. Yes. yes. Shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and yes. the heart of the children to their fathers. Yes. Lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Yes. Now, you may remember, you may, you may recollect that there was a time that they asked John the Baptist, said, John, who are thou? Are you the Messiah? He said, I'm not the Messiah. Are you the prophet? He said, I'm not the prophet. He said, who are you? He said, I'm the voice of one. I'm a voice that speaks for the wilderness. That's what he said himself. Make straight the path of the Lord. Every crooked shall be made straight. The rough edges shall be made smooth. He, make, he described himself as a voice. But Jesus Christ, they asked Christ one time about that. The, the scribe said, the Elijah should come, should have come. And Jesus said, Elijah has come and they did whatever they did to, to him, whatever they wish. Now, the, the, what I want, to, I want to raise a poser here. John the Baptist said he was not Elijah. Jesus Christ said John the Baptist was Elijah. Now the question is, who is correct? My answer is, both are correct. Yeah. There are two prophecies concerning Elijah. Mm. Isaiah prophesied concerning Elijah of the cooker being straight, 
rough edge being smooth. So by that prophecy, John the Baptist knew that that's what he came for. But there's a prophecy that is not yet to come to pass. So based on Malachi prophecy, let's see that Malachi again. Chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. Okay, 5 and 6. Behold, yes. I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great yes. and terrible day of Jehovah come. Yes. And he shall turn the heart of the father to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers. Lest yes. I come and smite the earth with a curse. Yes. This passage contains a promise, a prophecy, and a warning. John the Baptist said he was not Elijah because according to the prophecy of Malachi, the Elijah has yet to come because there's a place for Elijah to come again. But Jesus Christ said John was Elijah because Christ was referring to Isaiah's prophecy. So based on Isaiah's prophecy, John was an Elijah. But based on Malachi's prophecy, John was not Elijah. So both of them are correct. But the point I want to make is this. See, remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto you in order. Behold, I will send Elijah the I will send, means future. I will send Elijah the prophet before the coming and great and dreadful day of the Lord. Mm. The passage we read in verse in the Daniel chapter 12 talk of trouble times. Before the dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers. That's the prophecy. The pro promise is, I will send. That's a promise. The prophecy is, he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to the fathers. Lest I smite the heart with a curse. So that's a warning. If you notice now, in our generation now, fatherhood, sonship has become perverted. Mm -hmm. And there has to be a restoration of genuine fatherhood. Otherwise, the heart is going to enter a curse. Mm. Wow. So God said, I will send Elijah. Before that passage, if you read verse 3, three we're talking about Moses. But let's not talk about that. What we're, after now is that Elijah shall come again. And Elijah is one of the two witnesses that will come at the end of the time to fulfill an assignment in Israel. So he said, I will send Elijah the prophet before the coming and great day of the Lord, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the heart with the cause. So I pray that God will not, will not be smitten with the cause because mm -hmm. our generation shall fulfill the prophecy and shall enjoy it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So, like I said, a conditional promise does not fulfill an unconditional promise. The promise that God made for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is unconditional. The one he made for Israel is conditional. Now God is talking about, is giving us a warning now that we must restore fatherhood in the body of Christ. We must restore genuine sonship in the body of Christ. Otherwise, the perversion in the world will continue. And that is not God's plan. It is not the plan of God for to, the perversion to continue. God's plan is for us to work in love and unity and in wisdom and power. Praise the Lord. Amen. Now there's a scripture I would also like to read. First Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 from verse 1. Hi, brethren. Yes. When I come unto you, come not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming yes. to you the testimony of God. For I determine not to know anything among you 
save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Yes. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith should not, should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Yes. We speak wisdom, however, among them that are full grown, yet a wisdom not of this world, none of the rulers of this world who are coming to not. Yes, just stop there, sir. Yes. Now we say we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. Mm. Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that commit to naught. Mm. There's a divine mystery that is talking about here, about wisdom and about Christ. In the book of John chapter seven verse 30, the Bible says that they wanted to kill Jesus Christ, but they could not kill him because his time had not yet come. In John chapter 8, verse 20, the Bible said again that they wanted to kill Jesus Christ, but they could not kill him because his time had not yet come. So what Christ denies is this. Christ, like as if he fooled the principalities and powers, made himself to be a victim innocent victim, the lost victim, he died as Messiah. And the principalities and powers did not know this particular mystery. Mm. That's why the Bible says here that which none of the priests of this world knew, for I didn't know it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, eyes have not seen nor ear had, neither has he entered to the heart of man the things that God prepared for them that love him. So there's a mystery here that it is in the death and resurrection of Christ that we got our liberty. It is in the apparent weakness, mm. apparent weakness that Christ appeared weak, appeared as if he could not talk. Pilate asked him, are you the Messiah? And he said, thou says. He appeared weak, but it is his weakness that will get our strength. Mm -hmm. This is his weakness, we get our deliverance. This is in his weakness, we get our victory. This is in his weakness, we get our prosperity. Mm -hmm. So this wisdom is a special wisdom, it's a real wisdom. It's a wisdom, you say, your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Briefly, I would like to contrast wisdom and power. Before I continue, I would like to contrast wisdom and power. Ephesians 3 verse 20. Ephesians 3 verse 20. Oh, verse 20. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly Above all, that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus through Amen. all ages, world without end. Amen. Yes. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. A little about power and wisdom here. You see, according to the power that work with us, in us. There is a power available for us. Then there's a power that's work in us. Amen. Let me say this. The anointing that Christ has is anointing without measure. Yes, sir. The anointing that Lucifer has, he said, thou art the anointed cherub that cover it. Yes, sir. Satan's anointing is the anointing that cover it. The only thing that Christ has is, the Bible says, God gave him the spirit with that measure. So the only thing that Christ has is a measureless anointing. 
But the anointing that we have is an ever increasing anointing. Amen. Amen. Have, the anointing that believers in our generation have is an ever increasing anointing. Amen. That is why in Ezekiel chapter 47, he said, He measured a thousand cubits. Yes, sir. And the water was unto the ankle. Uncle. He measured a thousand cubits. And the water was unto the knee. He measured a thousand cubit, and the water was unto the hip. He measured a thousand cubit, and water became a river that cannot be passed. So Amen. the anointing that we have is an ever increasing anointing. Amen. Amen. Ever increasing anointing. So the Bible says, according to the power that worketh in us. So one of the things that we need to do as individual is to make sure that. We, the power that works in us is allowed to increase, is being refreshing. But the Bible says in Psalm 92, verse 10, say, My own shall thou anoint with the oil of a unicorn. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. So each of us need to be anointed with fresh oil. So I'm trying to contrast that power and wisdom here are related. Mm. They are not what's an opposite. Mm. So it, it's not something that we choose one or the other. We need both. Mm. And God will give us both in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's read Matthew chapter 11, verses 16 to 19. Matthew 11, verses 16 to 19. Okay. But whereunto shall I liken this generation? Yes. It is like unto children sitting in the market and calling unto their fellows. And saying, we have, part, we have peeped into you, have been unto you, and ye have not danced. We have mourned unto you, and ye have not lamented. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he had a devil. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a man gluten, a be glutinous. And a wine Bible, a friend of publican and sinners, but wisdom is justified of her children. Praise Lord. Yes, that's what's now. So, so in this place now, we learned some mystery, some revelation here hmm. that if you pervert your uniqueness, hmm. you will not please the people. Wow. Yes. If you pervert your uniqueness, you will not please the people. In fact, perverting your uniqueness will, be, will even endanger you and your ministry. Mm. Yeah, the Bible says, John came neither eating nor drinking, and they accused him of having a demon. Mm. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, mm. and they still accuse him mm. of being between us and white barber. So the Bible says, wisdom is justified of our children. So the one thing we can learn from here is that we must preserve our individual uniqueness mm. within the overall canopy that Christ gave us. Mm. So that because if we pervert our uniqueness, right now we're in the age of syncretism, mm. whereby many Christians are afraid to even declare that they are Christians. Mm. We're in an age now whereby many Christians cannot tell Muslims that they need to get born again. Mm. Many Christians tell, tell people that we are serving the same God. Mm. That's the nation we're in. That's a, that's a the nation of syncretism. Mm. But I will say here that John came neither eating or drinking. But the son of man came eating and drinking and they see accusing. Mm. But wisdom is justified of our children. John the Baptist had his assignment Mm -hmm. and finish his assignment and Christ also finished his assignment yes. like I said let me say this um, when John started his ministry John started his ministry by saying repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand Christ also started his ministry by saying the same thing mm -hmm. saying repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand let's read Luke chapter 11, verse 48 and 49. Luke chapter 11, verse 48 and 49. 
Verse 48 then, says, um, so ye are witnesses. Uh, truly, ye bear witness that ye allow the deeds of your fathers, for they yeah. indeed kill them, and ye build their sepulchres. Therefore also said the wisdom of God, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they shall slay and persecute. Thank you. The Bible said, hereby said, is this is wisdom that is speaking now. Now, one problem we have in our generation is that many Christians find it difficult to understand why they have problems or why problems occur in their life. The Bible says there that says the wisdom of God, it will send prophets, many of which will be killed. Now, like I said in the beginning, Nebuchadnezzar saw a vision of four kingdoms, Babylon, Persia, Greek, and Roman. And each of those kingdoms is succeeded by another kingdom. But the prince of Persia withstood the angel that was sent to deliver message to Daniel. But that angel has to be, because it is like, actually it's like the angel was kidnapped. But God sent Michael to deliver and rescue the angel and deliver the message from to, for Daniel. So right now, it means that the kingdoms of this world, there is a perplexity, there is confusion going on. And not only that the kingdoms don't know what to do, if the church don't intervene, we are going to more, more and more confusion. So it's the wisdom of God that says that Prophets will be attacked, and some of them will be forced, some of them will be killed. But God's plan has not changed. He has a plan for the saints, and part of that plan is that the saints will rise from the dead. We are still going to verse 2. Let's read Revelation chapter 13, verse 17 and 18. Revelation 13, verse 17 and 18. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Yes. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. Yes. Many people have noticed that many Christians that calculate the day of rapture, the day of Christ's coming, they have always gone to error. Hmm. The Bible says, here is wisdom. Let him that has understanding. Let him that has understanding. Let him that can it was count the number of the beast because his name, num the number is 666. This is a different mission on its own. But let me, the point I want to make is, this, is that this particular principality, the spirit of Antichrist is already working in our generation. But the Bible says, He that will let, we will until he's taken out of the road. So, so. John talk of spirit of Antichrist, the spirit of Antichrist that is operate, that operated during John's time and is operating in our generation. And as the end of time speed on, the spirit of Antichrist will operate more in our generation. So we should not be perplexed about Ebola, about uh, coronavirus, about any infirmity. The world will not end by sickness and infections. Mm. The world will end suddenly when Christ intervene to deliver his people by strength of power. Amen. Let me say something about uh, power. So we have read some, we have said some, we have read some part about that. Uh, but in Matthew chapter 10, verse 1, the Bible says he gave power to his disciples to cast out demons. Give them power. In Luke chapter 1, verse 12, John chapter 1, verse 12, the Bible says he came to his own, and his own received him not. 
but as many as receiving to them, give it power to become sons of God. So, this that's power. First Corinthians chapter two, verse four and five. First Corinthians chapter two, verse four and five. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but yes. in demonstration of the spirit and of power. Praise the Lord. I, hallelujah. Yes, that's it. Yes. You see, so Paul did not display woman wisdom. But every time genuine wisdom is displayed, it comes with power. In fact, when Christ he the sick, in fact, when he, mm, that's true. he met the person who was paralyzed and he said, Thy sins are forgiven thee. People wonder why is this do you, who, who is this man can forgive sins? But that you may have that you may know that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins. He not to the man, take up their bed and walk. And people are wondering what type of doctrine is this. So the mystery of Christ is a mystery of power and mystery of wisdom combined. And we need both. And God will allow us to manifest both in Jesus' name. Amen. Bible says in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, it says, We shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon us, and we shall be witnesses unto him, both in Jerusalem and in Judea. And Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the heart. Let me say now about wisdom again. The Bible says that in Ezekiel 23, 28, verse 3, it was it's, this one is like it's an irony. It said, Thou art wiser than Daniel. I want to compare three personalities now who display wisdom. Joseph, Solomon, and Daniel. And uh, I will ask you a question. Joseph, Solomon, and Daniel, who is wiser or who is the wisest? We're going to go this, the scripture will answer for us. We know that Joseph had dreams. He was sold into slavery. Then once upon a time, the chief butler and chief baker had dreams. And then and Joseph interpreted the dream. But he was not delivered until God allowed the king to have a dream that he could not interpret. Then Joseph interpreted the dream. But if you notice that when Joseph interpreted, Joseph did not just interpret the dream and said, there will be seven years of farming, followed by seven years of there was seven years of prosperity, followed by seven years of farming. Joseph did not hear. Joseph said there will be seven years of prosperity, followed by seven years of farming. Let Pharaoh appoint a man who is discreet to manage the resources. That statement is not part of the dream. Mm. It's not part of the dream. Yes, sir. Joseph had it. Mm. That's the man that let, let. It's not part of it. He had it. Now the Bible talk of that's Joseph. So see, so that Joseph is very, very anointed, a man who God who helped, who, who was used for by God for a season of an assignment in a generation. Then Solomon. The Bible says Solomon was the wisest man in his day. And the queen of Sheba came to learn wisdom from Solomon. In fact, the Bible will talk about many things. I'm saying, talk of many cities that the Bible talk about. And the Bible says, a greater than Solomon is here. A greater than Solomon is here. So Solomon was a man who was exceedingly wise. But if you see the end, you notice that Solomon's wisdom was not like David's wisdom or Daniel's wisdom. Solomon's wisdom was perverted and was polluted by his marriage, by his infidelity and many things. But Solomon was a very, very wise man. But there is a unique thing about Daniel. That is why I'm, I'm proposing today that the wisdom of Daniel is higher. Number one, let me give you a scripture. Ezekiel 28 verse 3. 
Ezekiel 28 verse 3. Ezekiel 28 verse 3. Says, Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. Yes, there is no secret. I think that statement is an irony. Hmm. It was not, it's not really actually, I was an irony statement. Thou hmm. art wiser than Daniel. It's a comparison. Hmm. Daniel not only was the fact that when the king wanted to kill all the noble of, of uh, Babylon. Daniel was able to interpret the vision that Nebuchadnezzar had and he did not know the, the meaning. Daniel could dissolve mysteries. Daniel had light understanding. Daniel said, Blessed be the name of the Lord, for wisdom and might are his, and in changed time and seasons. He revealed kings, he revealed mysteries. Well, Beshasha. Saw the handwriting on the wall. Many, many take care of pressing. God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. You have been weighed in the balance and found wanting. And your kingdom is given to the Medes and Persia. Daniel was able to decode it. The Daniel can read handwriting in Aramaic in English and in angelic writings. Mm. So in that area, Daniel supersedes Solomon and Joseph. Mm. And besides, the depth of revelation that Daniel has, no other person had it. Mm. The depth of mysteries, depth of encounters, spiritual encounters. So I want to propose today that each of us should seek divine encounters, mm. like Daniel sought, Daniel received, and God will bless us in Jesus. So so, there's, so the wisdom of Daniel supersedes that of Solomon and that of Joseph. But that wisdom is a unique wisdom because he submitted himself to God, allowed God to use him, and God did much. So back to our situation now. God said, Daniel, you will rest. Go, go, at, you know, go and seal it. Then it seal means go and hide the information. Mm. But you will rest a lot of, you are going to have rest at the end of your days. But this information now is for the latter end. So there are some mysteries now that God is unveiling a generation that were not known in previous generation. Mm. And those mysteries are such that they help us to understand divine patterns very well. Praise the Lord. So I want to say something now that since we're talking about the kingdom and about uh, how the kingdom moved from one king to another king, when Christ came, let's read Matthew chapter 3, verse 2. Matthew chapter 3, verse 2. And saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Yes. That's John the Baptist. Yes, sir. Then Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. Matthew 4, verse 17. Yes, sir. From that Matthew. time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Yes, so the same message that John the Baptist preached was what Christ started to preach mm. when he started his ministry. He offered the kingdom to the Gentiles. I want to understand this principle because we must not assume that God has forsaken the nation of Israel. He has not forsaken them. He offered the kingdom to Israel. In fact, in Matthew chapter 10, let's read verse 5 to 7. Matthew chapter 10, verse 5 to 7. This 12, this 12, Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans, enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Yes. 
by this time, the gospel was still offered to, to, to the Jew. The Jew were having a probability of whether they were accept the gospel or not. It was offered to them. But what I want to say something that talk about the postponement of the kingdom. And that is what, what is happening to us right now. He said, when you see a Samaritan, don't go near him. Don't go to Gentiles. This one is only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And they obeyed. They went. So at that time, the gospel was not offered to Samaritans. It was not offered to Gentiles. But this was not a mistake. It was deliberate. Luke chapter 19, verse 11 and 12. Luke chapter 19, verse 11 and 12. Luke chapter 19, verse 11 and 12. As they had these things, he added and spake a parable, saying, He was nigh to Jerusalem. And because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. Yes. And he said, Therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. But Thank you, sir. No, 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 you can stop here, sir. Yes, sir. You can stop. So, see, the Bible says he gave a parable because he was near Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the city of the great king. But so it's also the city whereby Christ would die. Mm. And because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. Mm. So at this time now, Christ is not telling them that kingdom is postponed. Mm. Kingdom is postponed. In fact, when Christ was about to go, Christ it, it told the Jews, he said, if you have known, at least in this day, the thing that belong unto you, but now they are hidden to you. He said, I wish I've gathered you like a hen, gather a chicks under her wings, but you will not. He said, your house is left to you desolate, and you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he that comes. In the name of the Lord. So the kingdom is postponed. But see, the postponement is so that the early believers, they were taking the gospel only to the Jews. It was the people of Antioch that began to preach to Gentiles. And that's how Christianity entered Europe. But the point I want to make is this, that God Part of the wisdom teaching is that we, are, should, be, we should be interpreter of science, mm. interpreter of prophetic seasons. On the day of Pentecost, the Bible says, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all together one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sun from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. On the day of Pentecost, the Bible says there were Jews, devout men, we are wondering what meaning this. Some say they are drunk with new wine. On the day of Pentecost, Peter became an interpreter of prophetic season. Peter discerned what was happening. He said, Brethren, these men are not drunk as you suppose. But this is that which was written by Prophet Joel. It shall come to pass in the last days. I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Young men shall see vision. Old men shall dream dreams. Upon my handmaiden, and my mistress will I put my spirit in those days, and, and they shall prophesy. He said, I will, I will show wonders in the heavens above signs, blood, fire, and pillar of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon into blood, before that great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Peter was quoting scriptures. Peter was quoting Psalm 110. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Peter was quoting Psalm 16. I saw the Lord before me. Because my right hand shall not be moved. 
was quoting scripture. Peter became an interpreter of prophetism. Amen. Which was a very great privilege. He became a Peter became a discerner and interpreter of prophetism. Yes. And through Peter's hand, God the mighty miracles, his uh, shadow was leading the sick. But there's something about Peter, and which is something that uh, I'm warning myself and I'm warning the brethren. That Peter that became an interpreter of prophetic season. When the season changed, and God wanted to send Peter to involve the Gentiles in his ministry, Peter was arguing with God. Mm. Peter, the Lord said, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Peter said, not so, Lord. Mm. Not so, Lord. Peter was arguing with God. And that became the decline of Peter's. That means a man can be an interpreter of God, people. Is it? Mm. Then when a new season comes, the man can argue against it. Mm. It's not a dilemma of our generation. Peter was an interpreter, an accurate interpreter of poverty season mm. on the operators. But when the season changed to involve the Gentiles, Peter became offended. Mm. Peter, remember his Jewish history. Mm. Peter's Jewishness became an entrance. Mm. Peter's Jewishness became an entrance to the new prophetic move. Right now, God is doing prophetic seasons. Yes, sir. Even the event in our nations, event in US, event in Nigeria, event in many countries, it shows that prophetic seasons are changing. Yes, sir. And as prophetic seasons are changing, we must not become hindrance to the move of God. Mm -hmm. If you cannot discern God's move, we should either keep silent mm -hmm. or pray about it, but we should mm -hmm. not speak against prophetic season. Oh, Lord. Mm. So, because in, in the generation that we are in now, I perceive that God will start with some strengthens. Amen. Strengthens. Amen. Through youth, through men, through women, strengthens. Mm. But Amen. nobody should assume that God's move is restricted to his own denomination. Mm. Peter was an accurate discerner of poverty season, but mm. he was offended when God wanted to start using the Gentiles. Mm. When he went to when he went to Colinus house, he didn't want to preach there. He went there in, in rebellion and mm. uh, in in half obedience. When he got to Colinus house, he said, "Colinus, I've come to God sent me to come and talk to you, and I don't go to you know I don't go to unbelievers' house." He was talking to Colinus that he doesn't go go to, go to unbelievers' house. <laughs> and, yes, and if not because God appeared to him, he wouldn't have come. He was just he was talking to Colinus. Was he God? <laughs> I pass his foolishness because while Peter here speak, Peter did not plan to make altar call for Holy Ghost baptism. Mm. He didn't even plan to make altar call for conversion. Mm. I would say the Holy Ghost by passing, he started mm. speaking tongues. Mm. So, see, but, so that and that and after that season, Peter's ministry actually slowly, mm. slowly and slowly, mm. and Paul's ministry rise because okay. God needed a man, mm. a man. A new season has evolved whereby the Gentiles must get involved. Mm. Christianity was no longer localized to the Jews. Mm. And that's how God has to raise the Paul. The Bible says, he that worketh effectively towards the apostleship of Peter mm. is the same person that worketh effectively mm. toward the apostleship of Paul. Yes, so oh Lord. God not silent Peter, but Peter mm. silent himself. Mm. And the ministry of Paul rises. So, it's very important for us to note that the kingdom of God was postponed. Mm. And so it's based on what this point is that there's going to be a resurrection at the end. Amen. That resurrection involves all living saints and all dead saints. They shall rise from the dead. Amen. Shall, it's part of God's plan, they shall rise from the dead. So I want to say something like that because. We are discussing wisdom, and wisdom is, is a very broad topic, and um, God will give us understanding. Amen. In Matthew 22, verse 21, Matthew 22, verse 21, 22, 21, 22, verse 21, they said unto him, Caesar's, 
Then said he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesars the things which are Caesars, and unto God the things that are God's. Yes. When they had had... No, that, that, thank you, sir. That's okay, sir. Yes, sir. Part of the wisdom we need for generation is to know when to give Caesar what is Caesar's hmm. and God what is God's. The present coronavirus pandemic is causing a blood whereby many Christians don't even know what to do, what to say. Mm. And I'm submitting that we must go back to this passage. Mm. Give unto Caesar what is Caesar's and unto God what is God. We must not give what is God to Caesar. We must not give what is God to Caesar. We must give unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Because they wanted to trick Christ. They were asking him whether it is right to pay, ta to pay tax. And Christ said, show me a superstition. Give them a, a coin. Whose superstition is this? He says, Caesar. He said, give unto Caesar what is Caesar's. So part of wisdom for living is that we must give Caesar what is Caesar's and God what is God. Luke 16, verse 8. Luke 16, verse 8. Yes, and the Lord commanded the unjust steward because he had done wisely. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. Yes. Thank you very much. The I will say that the unjust steward was utterly an unjust man. Mm. And he was also have been sacked by his master. <laughs> but he prepared for a future. Mm. He prepared for the future. And for that preparation, Christ did not condemn him. Mm. Right, Christ commended him. Mm. Prepare for the future. He prepared for it tomorrow. He, 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 even though that tomorrow, he did not have a future. Mm. But he prepared for it tomorrow. So I want to advise the believers of this generation to prepare for tomorrow. Mm. We must not limit our life to present events. Mm. There, is a, there is the coming of Christ that is coming sooner than later, mm. which the church must get prepared for. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1 to 5. Ecclesiastes 3, from verse 1 to verse, verse 5. five verse, yes, verse to, to everything five. there is a season and time to every purpose under the heaven. A time to burn, a bit to be born, and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to build up, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to yes. cast away stones, and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to get, and a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to cast away. A time to render and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. This passage is telling us that there is a time where an action is appropriate Mm. And I say, time why the same action is inappropriate. Mm. There's a time where it is right to do one thing, and there's a time whereby it is right to do the opposite. Mm. This scripture is telling you that there is a time whereby we should do one thing, and there's a time whereby we should do the opposite. That's what the scripture is teaching us. 
that in, in, in the time of season of life, God has made it that at a particular season of our life, let me give you an example now. For the first 40 years of Moses' life, it was God's plan for him to stay in the palace. But after some times, staying in the palace becomes compromise. Mm. It was God's plan for him to leave the palace. Mm. It is God's plan for him to leave the palace. I hear people talking about Christians in politics, and sometimes I'm amused. Because I know that God brought Esther into government. God brought Mordecai into government. But the same God took Moses out of the palace mm. for an assignment. Wow. Same God, yes, the same God took Moses out of the palace for a special assignment. God brought Daniel. Shadrach, Mesa, Abednego into government. Mm. But they did not lose their spiritual relevance mm. because they are in government. I know many Christians today in Nigeria who have entered politics and they have derailed. Mm. Some of them quote scriptures that somebody entered politics and they have derailed. They must understand this, but there's a time for one thing. It's time for the other. We must know sensitivity. John came neither eating nor drinking. They say he has a demon. Mm. The son of man came eating and drinking. They say a man glutinous and went by blood. <laughs> Wisdom is justified of our children. Mm. So praise the Lord. So there is a season. Another season, another thing I think we should learn wisdom for wisdom for living is when to accept gifts and when mm. to reject gifts. Daniel accepted Nebuchadnezzar's gift, but rejected Belshazzar's gift. Mm. Daniel accepted Nebuchadnezzar's gift, but I believe that when Daniel read the writing on the wall, mm. many, many take care of prison. You have been Weigh the balance and find one thing. God has numbered your kingdom and finish it. And your kingdom is given to the media and Persia. I believe as a statement that he saw, we ignore it. That mm. means you will die tonight. Mm. God, you can never give him a gift and he collected it. Mm. But Shasha gave then a gift, he didn't collect it. Mm. But I would say that night, mm. the man was slain. The man was slain, and the Medes and Persia took over the kingdom that night. So Daniel, I believe Daniel knew that that man would die that night. So Daniel didn't want to collect his gift. Elisha mm. collected the gifts from the Shunammite woman, mm. but rejected gift from mm. Naman. Mm. So believers should be sensitive. Believers should be sensitive. He rejected gifts from Naman, mm. but collected gifts from Shunammite woman. Mm. Shunammite woman gave Elisha accommodation, mm. gave Elisha freedom, and Elisha collected it. Mm. But Elisha did not accept gifts from Naman. In fact, the that collected gift from Naman was <laughs> punished. Was punished. So there's a time to accept gifts. There's a time to reject gifts. The Bible says we are salt and light. We are salt and light. And many people have used this scripture to teach how we should go into the old world and make the world better. Mm. I have nothing against that, but I want to submit to yours. The same Bible says we are strangers and pilgrims. We must not forget that we are strangers and pilgrims while remembering that we are salt and light. 
that we are sons and lights does not revoke the fact that we are also strangers and pilgrims. We are strangers and pilgrims in this world. And it is because we are strangers and pilgrims, that's why we can focus on Christ and we can be heavily minded. I know that we should not be too heavily minded that we forget our relevance, but Nigerian Christians, African Christians, many Christians in the world presently are more worldly minded than heavily minded. So we are strangers and pilgrims, yet we are salt and light, but we are still strangers and pilgrims, which means we must fulfill our destiny. God will help us fulfill our destiny in Jesus' name. Amen. The other thing I want to make point is that is I noticed that wise men from the east mm. they pick signal about Christ's coming, Christ's first coming. Mm. Where Herod could not pick it. Mm. Wise men from the east pick the signal. In fact, they almost derailed because they went to ask Herod, where was Christ to have been born? And Aaron called the religious men of his generation. And those religious men said it, that Christ was to be born in Bethlehem. But the Bible says that the angel directed them to go, to, to go back to another route, not through the route. But Eros wanted to come and he told them to come back and tell him. So he would go and pay homage. It was a deception. He did not, he did not, they did not obey it. They followed God and they went to the other means. The wise men picked the signals of Christ's coming. Simeon and Anna picked the signals of Christ's coming. Mm. The shepherds pick the signals of Christ's coming. Mm. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, mm. the leaders of Israel did not pick the signal of Christ's coming. My fear is that the present generation of Christians may miss the revelation about Christ's coming. Right now, there are old churches now that don't believe that Christ is coming again. The Bible said that Simeon entered the temple, and when he saw Christ being dedicated, he said, Now let us thou thy servant depart in peace, according to thy word. Simeon was praying to die. Simeon was praying to die. He was not praying to die just for the sake of dying. After seeing the revelation of the Messiah, say, this baby is the Christ. He said, God, if you take me home right now, it's okay. That was the Anna, who has lived for many years in widowhood, spoke the same words concerning Christ. I believe that some Christians will pick the signals of Christ's coming. I believe it. I believe that some Christians we know, we have an idea of when Christ comes soon. I believe so. The whole most of Christians may not know. They may be sleeping, but some few Christians will pick the signals of Christ's coming. And Anna to pick the signal. Pick the signal that Christ was coming and she was okay, she was she was correct and uh, she was part of the end time army that saw Christ and I pray that God will give us that generation make up part of those generations that, that saw Christ. Now mm-hmm. I want to mm-hmm. round up by saying some things see about wisdom that the New Testament, the Bible that we are, we are reading, the New Testament contains three important information, just like a summary. 
The New Testament contains three important information. Number one, that Christ has left heaven and has come to the heart. Number two, and Christ has left heaven, come to the earth, and go back, gone back to heaven. Number two, the Holy Spirit has left heaven and is presently on earth. Mm. And number three, Jesus Christ is coming again. Those three statements have implications for the believers and for the unbelievers. Number one, the Bible says he came to his own and his own receiving not. But to those that receive him, give them power to become sons of God. The unbelievers are guilty of Christ's death. All of us are actually guilty of Christ's death. Both Pilate, Herod, and people who visit, they are guilty of, of Christ's death. Before man, Christ was a martyr. But before God, Christ was a victim. Mm. He died for sacrifice. It was a sacrifice. So Christ left heaven, came to the heart, and has gone back. When he was going back, disciples asked him, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? They were asking because they were expecting that Christ will remove Roman yoke and immediately install the kingdom. But like I said before, there are poverty seasons. Mm. That was not the season for that. So he said, it is not for you to know the time and season where the Father has set apart by himself, but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Judea and Jerusalem and Samaria, the part of the world. So Christ has left heaven, come to the earth and has gone back. He has ascended back to heaven. Number two, the Holy Spirit is presently on. He has left heaven and is now with us. So this is the dispensation of the Holy Spirit. He's presently with us. Concerning believers, the Holy Spirit is our counselor, is a comforter, is our intercessor, is our helper, is our advocate, is our standby and our strengthener. That's what it is to the believers. But to the unbelievers, it is convict of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Instead of sin, because they believe what in me. Of righteousness, because I go to the Father and shall see me no more. And of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. So the Holy Spirit is not a neutral person. He has effect on both the believer and unbeliever. For us, it's our comforter, it's our counselor, it's our, it's our, it's our, it's our helper, it's our advocate. It's our standby, it's our straight now. But for the unbeliever, it will convict the word of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And the third point I want to make is Jesus is coming again. And he's probably coming sooner than we think. Sooner than we think. Jesus is coming again. He said, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. We shall be changed. The passage we read, Daniel 12, verse 30 says that they that turn many to righteousness shall shine as brightness. Brightness. Every believer, we have many ministries, but our primary ministry is that of evangelist. Paul to Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. We must not forget that we have the ministry of evangelist. So I would like to round up by saying this, by asking some questions. Number one, are you prepared for the 
coming of Christ? Are you prepared for a, for a possible coming of Christ in your generation? Are you aware that Christ may come in your generation? Then number two, if Christ does not come and you have to be like Peter, Peter knew he will not be raptured. Christ told Peter, when you are young, you are able to go to where you like, do whatever you like. But when you are old, they will carry to where you don't like. Bible said, this signifies by which death Peter will die. So Peter knew that he will die. But Paul did not expect to die. Paul thought he was among those that will be raptured. He said, we which are alive shall be caught up. Mm. So my question is that if you are not among those, if you are not expecting, if you are not expecting Christ, number one question is, are you expecting Christ in your generation? Number two, are you prepared to face death with calmness? Because we are living in a generation in some part of the world now. It takes God's grace to survive. We are being attacked left, right, and center. Kidnapping is rampant. And people ask why. The question I want to ask is not why. Is Are you prepared to face death with calmness? Mm -hmm. If God tells you that you are like Peter, that you will die and you make heaven, mm -hmm. are you prepared to face death with that ambiguity, with that accusing God? May the grace and peace of God be with you. Amen. May God bless you and keep you. Amen. May his face shine upon you and give you Amen. peace. May he give you long life prosperity. Amen. And bless you. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Ah. Praise, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's as if you shouldn't stop. <laughs> <laughs> praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, the Lord bless and multiply you in Jesus' name more and more in Jesus' Amen. name. Amen. Amen. Please, let's lift our daddy in the Lord. Uh, uh, maybe before that, sir, please, if you don't, if you don't uh, pray for us, uh, uh, those that may need one prayer or the other, healings uh, and, uh, you know, intervention in any of our uh, area of our lives. Uh, so please we'll be glad if you yeah hello sir yes i'm hearing you i'm hearing you yes, sir. so that you uh, okay. so you uh, please we don't mind if you pray for us and, yes. Uh, yes sir it's a privilege mm. uh, thank father you, we thank you because you are the god of all flesh yes lord and you reign in majesty Amen. today i declare Mercy and peace for your people. Amen. Take away shame and reproach from our midst. Amen. Banish wickedness from our midst. Amen. Give your people rest. Give your people peace. Give your people Amen. sanity in the name of Jesus Christ. Today, I pray for any form of sickness, every form of affliction. I receive mercy on, on their behalf in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Receive perfect healing in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I receive grace. Mercy, upliftment Amen. in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for answering us because we are prayed in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, sir. Uh, uh, please let's lift our dad in the Lord in prayers uh, that God will bless him, multiply him, and his ministry in Jesus' name. Uh, the Amen. family in the name of Jesus. Father, Amen. we commit our Father and the Lord into your hand that you will multiply him. That your grace upon him we multiply in the name of Jesus, that he will keep growing and growing and growing. He will never diminish in the name of Jesus. He will never Amen. go down in the name of Jesus. We cover him, the family, with the blood of Jesus, that your grace and your spirit will never depart from him in the name of Jesus. And Amen. he will always and forever be fresh in every for every season, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, our Father and our God. We bless your name. Thank you for the ministry you have committed to his hands. 
the Lord, you will multiply it the more in the name of Jesus. Wider mm -hmm. doors, oh God. Greater doors mm -hmm. in the name of Jesus. Thank mm -hmm. you, mighty God. We bless and we worship your name. Thank you, our Father. In Jesus' precious name, we have prayed. Amen. In Amen. precious name, we Amen. have prayed. Amen. And we are really, 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 really grateful uh, for this uh, real privilege. We uh, would not take it for granted. Thank you so much, sir. We've been blessed over and over and over again. Praise the Amen. Lord. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, it's as if you should stop. Um, <laughs> thank you so much. We're, 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 God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. What a word. We thank you, uh, Daddy and the Lord, for a powerful teaching. Uh, is a great revelation, and we pray that the Lord will continue to increase you on every side in Jesus' name. Amen. And uh, when next uh, we want to have you, you'll be available for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, um, we want to appreciate all our viewers on Facebook and uh, on Zoom. And uh, we want to tell us about giving, you know, giving our tithe and offering. Uh, King David said to Arana in Second Samuel chapter 24, verse 24, he said, I will give God nothing, anything that will not cost me anything, I will not give it unto God. So whatever I'm giving to God, it will cost me something. So, and uh, we have a secure link that we, we can give our offering through. I assured you is uh, internationally recognized and uh, I assure you your credit card, your master care card is saved on this link. Just press on the link and it will take you to where you can give your offering and your tithe. And God bless us in Jesus name. Shall we pray? As we give our tithe and offering, our Father and our God, we thank you this morning, and we thank you for uh, how you have blessed us. We thank you for your blessings on every side. We pray, Lord Jesus, as we are giving our tithe and offering this morning, and for us, many people that are in other parts of the world that they are at night currently, we pray that you will bless us in the name of Jesus and you will replenish our pocket in the name of Jesus. For as many people that are saying, God, I wish I have, I would love to give. We pray that you bless them in the name of Jesus. And when next we gather, they will have bountiful offerings to give unto you in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for answered prayers. For in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone, in Jesus' name. Yeah, it's a great, 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 great uh, blessing time uh, in the presence of the Lord. And uh, I believe the Lord has ministered to you in one way or the other. And uh, everything we need in this season and for the next season of our lives, the Lord himself will remind us at the right time in Jesus' name. I will not miss the right step to take at the right time in Jesus' name. Uh, God bless you as we say the grace together. All right. And now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, Christ and the love, love of God, God and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit, Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Surely. God's goodness and message of all, of us, all the days of our lives. We shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. So I want everybody to say thank you, sir. 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 Thank you
Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Amen. God bless All right, you. Sir. Amen. So we will see you on Wednesday by the grace of God. Yeah. Amen. Bye for prayer and Bible study. Yeah. God bless you in Jesus. Name. Have a wonderful week. Jesus name. Yeah. I stay safe in Jesus name. Amen. The Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Have a wonderful day. Yeah. Okay. Thank <laughs> you.